right, we're away. Can everyone make that out? It's a bit smaller than normal, but it's less um, so, as I said, when I got here, um, the guy to replace the screen was here this morning at 8.30 um, and decided that half hour wasn't enough to get it done, but I think he'll be in here after this. So, hopefully this is the end of our room dramas, um, but I can't promise it because it is what it is. Um, so, hopefully you had a good break. Um, I intentionally didn't put the workshop up because I figure you have other assignments and you can sort of um, have a bit of a rest from 2525 for the break. I'll be putting the workshop up today. Um, so that's due, I think, at the end of week 13, but I'll, I'll have a quick look at it and make sure you've got enough time to do it. And if it's not enough, I'll put it in like a recess or whatever. Um, but that, that should be enough. Uh, most of you will have started to think about that. <coughs> Effectively, you're doing exactly what you did before. You're just finding a weld. Um, weld has to be under fatigue. Uh, and you need to analyze it using all the well techniques that you've used. Um, so, you know, um, go nuts. If you haven't found one already, please start looking and read the workshop information that I put up today. All right, so uh, for the next, I think probably four lectures, we'll be looking at bolts, uh, and then we will be looking at gears, uh, and then we'll be done. Alright, so bolts and gears are the last two major components. This is bread and butter stuff, so if you can't analyse a bolt, um, then you've probably not um, got enough mechanical engineering know how to survive. Um, so we need to be able to do this sort of stuff. Gears are quite interesting because obviously you need to be able to spec out gear trains and that kind of stuff, and I'll teach you some analysis techniques for those as well. Um, now with gears, a lot of the time you get off the shelf stuff, so you just need to make sure what your horsepower transmission is and Oftentimes it'll tell you in a catalogue, but whenever you need to cut your own gears, you need to be able to analyse the teeth properly, so that's uh, what we'll talk about there. Now, bolts, um, I'd say probably bolts are the most complicated thing that you'll analyse by hand. And the only real, real, real reason for that is that instead of just having a load on and off in a fatigue circumstance, you might have a pretension as well. And that pretension affects the way that you deal with the AM diagram. Um, and that pretension also uh, changes the way that we analyse bolts because if you have enough pretension, then friction between the things that you're bolting together often carries the load, and so you don't need to analyse certain dimensions of the bolt. Okay? So there's, it's pretty much as complicated as it gets. After you do three or four of them, It'll be pretty straightforward, um, and everything more complicated than this will be using finite elements for anyway. All right, so um, it, it'll be a bit of a learning curve with bolts, but we'll have enough examples on it, and you'll have enough goes at it to be able to do it pretty comfortably by the end, hopefully. So bolts are obviously very, very important. Um, if you haven't seen a bolt in a machine, you probably haven't looked at a machine by now. Um, we are doing everything from holding things like uh, actual you know, heads on engines, holding things together, holding plates together. Basically any time that you need to be able to join something and then separate it for maintenance, a bolt is your go-to. Obviously if you don't ever need to separate it again, you can probably weld it, but if you need to get anything from out, you know, out of the inside of it, then a bolt, some sort of threaded member is going to hold that together. And we need to be able to deal with the forces on those bolts because obviously if you're dealing with any number of different circumstances, those bolts are going to be under tension, they're going to be under shear, they're going to be under all sorts of combined loading that we need to be able to take into consideration. Alright, so this lecture is largely an introduction to some of the terminology around bolts, some of the different tables and materials and standardizations. Uh, and then in the second part, I've got uh, a fairly lengthy example that will do the, the first static case, uh, and then we'll start to talk to, about fatigue in the next, the next lectures. Um, bolts come in two directions, so right-hand thread, left-hand thread. Anyone who's ever heard righty tidy, lefty loosey, yeah? That's a right-hand thread, so that's a standard thread. Most of your bolts will come that, which means that you tighten it, going around clockwise and you loosen it coming around anti-clockwise. Righty tighty, lefty loosey. Uh, the example that I have on the left there is that. So if you look down the shank of the bolt, the thread basically spirals forward like that. 
right? And you can actually visualise that screwing in uh, whichever way that it needs to screw in to actually force it in. So right hand, ideally. Now, the other thing is, well, that's a left-handed thread. So a left-handed thread, you basically tighten in the opposite direction, right? Uh, what would be a circumstance where we use a left-handed thread? Gas Sorry? Gas fittings. Sorry? Gas fittings. Gas fittings. Yeah, yeah. What else? Why would we use a left-handed thread? Tensioners. Yep, tensioners. So the right-handed thread and a left-handed thread. Absolutely. So you move the centre bit and it actually pulls it together or pushes it out. What else? Wheel nuts. So uh, stuff. If you have a nut on a wheel stub or some sort of a rotating shaft, what you on one side it'll be rotating and the inertia will be tightening the bolt. If you have the same thread oriented on the other side, the inertia will be loosening the bolt. And so what you might want to do is put a left hand thread on one side and a right hand thread on the other, so that the motion of the shaft is tightening it the whole time. Um, that's a very common one for, for rotating components. Um, so there's lots of different circumstances where you might use a left-handed thread. Um, just familiarise yourself with the difference because they're more common than you think. All right? um, and if you're trying to put a right-handed bolt into a left-hand threaded hole, you'll be there a while as well. And chances are you'll probably break some gear if you try to force it. So the one on the left is an example of that, or one on your right. Uh, the other thing with bolts is you can have a single thread or a double thread. All right, so I think single thread, basically you can put your finger on the thread and roll it all the way around the bolt and you've touched every single bit of thread. A double thread has two effectively waveforms opposite by sort of 180 degrees to one another. And so if you only touch one, you're going to touch every second thread around because you'll have an opposite thread. Uh, now, obviously single threads are the most common. Single threads are the easiest to manufacture. You can just do it with a standard tap kit. You need very specialised tap kits to do a double, uh, to do the double thread version. Why might we use a double thread? Anyone? Have the same length like you have twice as much contact. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so by having that extra thread there, you actually have more contact for any given cross section of that bolt. So theoretically, you have more axial load carrying capability in the thread, assuming that thread failure is your issue rather than bulk shank failure. Um, downside to that is you've got twice the stress concentration because you've got twice the threads. Um, but if you need something that um, will grip and perhaps Oftentimes, if you have very, very shallow threads, if you've only got a very small window or very small area that you can have the threads, if they have to be very shallow, sometimes a double thread would be better because in the, on both sides you can actually carry that load rather than on one side if it's very, very short. Um, but there's a few examples where double thread might be better than single thread, so just keep that in mind. Uh, for the most part, we'll just analyse a single, single thread um, and then we'll sort of leave double thread and bolts for specialised stuff that you can look up in a textbook uh, if you require. Alright, so um, who's gone to Bunnings and bought a bolt to replace a bolt? Yeah, so we? Um, and fundamentally, size um, and whether it's coarse or fine threads, and we'll talk about that, but pretty much you buy a nut to fit your bolt or you buy a bolt to fit your nut, it's standardised. All right, so you don't need to actually cut a new bolt every single time and you definitely do not want to be cutting a new bolt, a new different type of profile every single time. There are standardised thread patterns, thread sizes, that mean that you buy a tap to do an M10 and that M10 is going to be exactly the same as a bolt that you buy from Bunnings or a bolt that you buy from Boltmaster or a bolt that comes to stand with the, the machinery. All right, so those standardisations make uh, machines very, very um, sort of easy to maintain, easy to replace um, components. And this is some of the standard thread profiles that we're talking about. So uh, normally your angle on the threads will be 30 or will be 60 degrees, that's called your crest. Uh, now your root <coughs> diameter is to the actual root, imagine the root, the base of that thread. 
Uh, your major diameter is to the outside. So if you put a vernier caliper on a bolt, that's your major diameter, that's your outside diameter. And your pitch diameter is the very centre plane there. And the pitch diameter of the bolt and the pitch diameter of the nut or the thread that you're screwing in overlap. Okay? So when you have thread meeting with thread, the pitch diameter from the hole and the pitch diameter from the bolt align. So that's basically the line in the centre of the two. That's where they meet. Alright? Now, major diameter, the outer diameter is generally the one that we specify the bolt on. Uh, for very practical purposes, you stick a vernier caliper on the bolt and it's 10 mils and that's an M10 bolt. Alright, so that's, that's for the, all the tests and purposes, that's the easiest thing to talk about. Uh, what else do we need? Um, so P, P is, what's that, the pitch? Um, and that's the distance between each successive thread. Uh, and then the distance at the top of that thread is generally that measurement divided by about 8 and the root is generally that measurement divided by about 4. All right? So that's the standard size for a thread. All right, now, the stress area for a bolt, we could just calculate that based on the... Wake up computer. There's my cursor. Can you see that up there? So the root diameter. That would be the most critical case, right? So you can imagine that you've got threads, but that root diameter is a circular cross-section that you know that there's material for that entire circular cross-section. Now, if we did that, that's actually a smaller cross-section than what we have for a bolt, and so that's uh, a little bit too conservative because we can actually calculate what the actual cross-section of a bolt is. You can imagine that if you took a bolt, and you actually took a hacksaw to it, you'd be chopping partly through that circular cross-section and partly through one of those threads that is sticking out. And that's the image that I have here. So if I took a cross-section here, I don't just have a circular cross-section, that's my circular cross-section there. I actually have a bit of extra area up there for where the thread is. Uh, and that extra area will carry load and that extra area will actually decrease the stress and so it's worth taking into consideration. So when we talk about the stress area of a bolt, or the effective area of that bolt, that's taking into consideration that extra little area that you're going to get from having those threads. And that's everywhere because if I moved you know, a little bit this way, that would just rotate around a little bit, but it would be the same area the whole way down, and that's what actually characterises that whole thread all the way down. Um, we can calculate that effectively by the average between the two, between the root and the pitch. So between this pitch diameter, the centre there, and the root diameter, it's kind of the average between the two, and that's people have calculated that based on geometry or whatever. That's that's an approximation to that. All right. Fortunately, you don't need to know that because we've got a table. Yeah. So this is this is the background where it's calculated from, and now you forget that and never need to use it ever again. Um, this table is in your textbook, and it is table ten. <coughs> Point, whatever it was. <coughs> so, for anyone playing at home, uh, the ISO uh, is on page 414, my version of the textbook. Just make sure that that's the box. Yeah, there we go, the types. So, that's 414 for the ISO, so that's uh, all of your millimetres. And then we've got 416 for the Imperial, which is the next one that I have here. Oh, no, I've got Imperial first, and then metric. Oh, I skipped over, sorry. 413 for Imperial, 414 for metric. Okay, we good with that? So this one's the Imperial. Size is down the left there. Um, I might go to the metric because it's a bit smaller and it's easier to make out, um, but you guys can look at the Imperial in your textbook when you get there. So this is our nominal diameter, so you want an M10 bolt, 10 millimetres, yeah? Uh, you want an M6 bolt, 6 millimetres, etc. So that's, that's the, the, the broad size of the bolt. The pitch, now the pitch is that distance between the threads, right? And we have two categories here, we have coarse threads, and we have fine threads. Right? 
And the whole difference between coarse threads and fine threads in bolts is that pitch. Fine thread, they're closer together, which means that for a given length you have more threads. All right? And for a given length, more threads means you're going to carry more load or distribute the load more evenly through those threads. A bit, bit similar to having sort of double thread rather than a single thread pattern. Um, but it's easier to manufacture a finer thread than it is a, a double. So it's much more common to do that. Um, you'll find that any sort of high tensile application, chances are you'll be dealing with fine threads. All of the high tensile rod ends and things on the motorsports car are all fine thread. Um, you just have a different tap set for them, obviously. Um, and so the thing that distinguishes them in metric is your pitch. So you'll have, say, M10 is M10 regardless, but the pitch for coarse thread is 1.5 millimetres. That's the distance between successive threads. And if we go across here to the fine threads, it's 1.25. So it's 0.25 of a mil closer. Cool. Now, uh, minor diameter or your root diameter. I think that's root diameter, is it? Yep, root diameter. Sorry, I could make out that R there. So that's the, the diameter of the, the actual base of the, the threads. And then you've got your effective stress area, AT. Um, and you can calculate those, but they're given, it makes it a lot easier. And cut for beginners, that's millimetres squared. How do we convert millimetres squared to metres squared? divided by a thousand squared. So divided by a million basically. If you convert millimetres to metres, you divide it by a thousand. Millimetres squared to metres squared, you divide it by a thousand squared. Millimetres cubed to metres cubed, divided by a thousand cubed, etc. So the conversion for single units, as soon as you put a power on it, you put a power on your conversion as well. Cool. So when you actually take these numbers, make sure you divide it by a million and not a thousand and not a and not, you know, any incarnation of all the stuff that I see in quizzes and exams, which is effectively making a very simple error and making it propagate through your entire solution and have a very big impact. Okay, so get that sort of simple stuff right. And you can see effective area is a little bit different between coarse and fine threads. A little bit more area for the fine threads, and that's because they're closer together, and so you've got more of that sort of peak. Cool. Alright, same thing for the Imperials. Um, down the left hand side we've got size and that's in our everyone loves fractions. Um, and then major diameter is not in fractions because it's too, um, too many decimal places. And in terms of your um, actual coarse or fine threads, that comes in threads per inch. So it's a little bit different with the metrics. It's an actual literal measurement between the um, between the threads. In Imperial, it comes in threads per inch. How many threads per that inch length of, of bolt? Uh, and again, you've got tensile stress area. Fortunately, that's in inches squared, so you don't need to change that. If we work in inches, we're we'll calculating stress with Imperial. Cool. Once again, coarse versions, fine versions. All right. This is all the really fundamental bits and pieces of just understanding how to specify bolts. Most of this will just be, it'll come in the form of you've got an M10 by 1.25 bolt. You need to understand what that means and this is where that, that comes. So, when we specify the bolts, again there's a standard way of saying the size of the bolt and in that size that tells you everything you need to know about the actual size of the bolt and you go back to that table and you'll get the other stuff, right? So for metric or unified, sorry, for imperial or unified, it's a value, inches, dash, some size, UNC, or UNF. What do you reckon UNC and UNF are? Coarse and fine. Yep. Uh, and it actually says that in the table there. So coarse threads, UNC, fine threads, UNF. Alright, so the way you specify if you want a half inch bolt that has coarse threads, you go half inch dash 13 UNC because on the table, if we go to our half inch bolt, which is there ish, and I wanted coarse thread, then half and 13. 
half and 13. So it's 13 threads per inch for a coarse fault, and it's a half inch major diameter. And then if you want the area, you go back to that table and work out that that's a coarse one, and it's half inch, and so you get your area. That's everything you need to know about that size, right? Metric, again, it's a little bit different. M means metric, so any bolt that has an M something, it's a metric bolt. Um, the diameter, so that's that major diameter again, by, and that's a multiplied sign, the pitch. And the pitch is, again, that final course. You don't actually have an F or a C on the specification for metric, you just need to go to that table and work out whether it's an F or a C based on what the pitch is. So if it's an M10 by 1.5, it's a course, it's an M10 by 1.25, it's a fine. Yeah? So M8 by 1.25, Come back here, M8, 1.25 is a coarse thread. If it was M8 by 1, it would be a fine thread. Simple stuff. Everyone understanding what they're reading in a Bunnings catalog now? Cool. All right, a couple more slides and then we'll do an example again. Um, this, is, this is just the Bolts 101 stuff that, um, if you read the first half of the textbook chapter, then you'll get most of this. Um, but if I cut straight into an example saying all of this type of terminology, then you guys will be lost, uh, and that's no good. Alright, so, what sort of loading is on a bolt? What's a major loading mechanism on a bolt, normally? Yeah, shears one. What else? Yeah, axial. Axial and shears are major too, but there's a few others and I'll talk about that. So, the first one, when you initially tighten up a bolt, you're going to have torque on yeah? So there's almost no circumstance in service life where a bolt will have torque on it. But when you initially tighten that bolt, when the threads lock, or when you actually bottom out the bolt, and you keep yanking on the wrench, you're actually putting torque on that bolt. All right? So a lot of the danger for bolts are in tightening and loosening. Once they're on, and if you've done it right, then they're pretty good in service if you've analysed them correctly, but you're at the whim of the operator when you're tightening and loosening a bolt. Uh, and if there's a little bit, uh, you've got been overzealous with the Loctite, or it's bound and uh, rusted in the threads when you're taking it off, or if someone really likes tight, tight bolts and they have a very, very long wrench and you've expected them to have a very, very short wrench, chances are they can shear the head straight off that bolt and then you've got a whole world of pain in your ass trying to get, get it out. Um, you need a whole different set of tools and all sorts of things. Um, so, uh, you need to be careful in your analysis to, if you're specifying some sort of a, a design, you need to stipulate the initial tightening uh, and if you're tightening this uh, significantly, um, so quite high torque, you need to be a bit careful about not over-torquing that bolt. Um, and making that clear in the manufacturing drawings. But that's about the last time you need to worry about that. And when they're taking it off, if it's rusted in the hole, that's not really your problem, that's just an issue that bolts have. Um, so people will shear them off and they're not going to come back to you and say, you didn't design for this being rusted in the hole and me talking it too hard. It's just operator error in that circumstance. Um, axial loading is our major one with bolts. So if you're going to torque this thing up and actually have compression in the plates, then you've got axial loading. Uh, if those plates then want to separate for some whatever design purpose, uh, then again you've got axial loading in that bolt. That's one of our major ones. Bending. Bending is very uncommon in bolts, and I'm not going to teach you how to analyse it. But you guys know how to analyse bending for a shaft, and a bolt is just a shaft with threads on it. Yeah? So if you come across a circumstance where for whatever unknown reason there's bending on a bolt, you as good engineers with your good engineering minds will be able to work out some sort of an analysis strategy that gets you close. Uh, and if need be, you can do an FBA on it or something like that. Right. We're not going to bother with it, but it can happen. It can happen. Firstly, sometimes if you have something like this, so that's obviously kind of like a flange, and somehow that flange maybe has failed on one side or it's opened up on one side and it actually sort of torques the bolt out. Still, it would be fairly uncommon for that to be bending on the bolt so much as more axial load. If this, if 
this part is very, very, very short, maybe it becomes bending on the bolt. But if that's long, or you know, even the, the length of the bolt equivalent, which it should be if it's a gasket, um, then it's going to pivot on that end and it's going to put axial on the bolt anyway. So that's fairly uncommon. Much, much more common is if you've got uneven surfaces. If you're trying to bolt something together and your two surfaces are on angles, as you talk up that bolt, the nut and the bolt head are going to come into contact with the high side before they actually come into contact with the low side. And if you ratchet that thing up, then it will cause bending in the bolt. Uh, generally speaking, that's terrible design practice, so don't do it. Um, ways to get around that, ordinarily you would machine a recess just in the vicinity of the bolt head there. Um, if you can't do that, you could get some sort of a custom angled washer on there potentially. Um, and there's a few other ways to avoid it as well. Um, you, you guys are engineers, you can design a way to avoid it if need be. Um, but sometimes that might happen and in very, very rare circumstances you might need to take that bending into consideration. Shear. Shear we'd like to avoid on a bolt, um, and if we don't avoid it, then it tends to be the most critical because remembering back to when we were talking about loads, on a bolt, it's direction. Right? It's not nicely distributed shear throughout an entire cross-section. It's right on that one plane between the two plates. All of that shear is carried by that single area. Um, now, with the exception, this is called single shear, obviously because we have a single plane of shear. This is called double shear because we have two planes of shear, which is facilitated by either having two plates here or some sort of a, you know, a clever type arrangement. Which one's better? Double. Always double. Yeah. So for the same load, double shear means you've got double the equivalent load carrying area, so half the stress for the same problem. Additionally, if you have single shear and those plates are thick, then chances are you're going to start to introduce a bit of bending as that bolt actually deforms and goes to a sort of an angle as it's separated. Whereas you have none of that issue here, that bolt stays perfectly straight up and down as the, the plates pull itself apart. So every possible opportunity to achieve double shear rather than single shear should be investigated. All right? uh, there's a rule in the FSAE stuff that any, any critical bolts need to be in double shear or you need to do all this special other stuff to make sure that they don't fail. Um, and that's for a reason and that's quite common in, in those sorts of circumstances. So double shear is much, much better on a bolt. If you have the opportunity, make it double shear. Alright. So, how do we, what is our failure criteria for a bolt? Um, bolts have what's called a proof load, which is, so you've got your ultimate tensile strength, you've got your yield strength for all materials. Bolts have a proof load, which is kind of the, the load that the bolt's been tested to, um, and it tends to be 5 to 10% less than yield, all right? So for a bolt, the proof load tends to be the value that we analyze, certainly for static failure. Uh, and then we do all of our AM diagram stuff for, for um, the, the fatigue phase. Now we have more tables in your textbook, so same chapter obviously. Uh, table 10.4 is, let me right this time. Table 10.4 is on 433 in my book. Hopefully that's the same as your book, we'll give or take a page. Uh, and 434 is table 10.5. So this is 10.4. Uh, this is for uh, Imperial. And the material properties of a bolt are specified in grade. So you have different grades of bolts. Has anyone seen these type of designations on the end of a bolt head? Different lines like that? Anyone? Yeah. So some of the bolts um, that you would buy at Bunnings, some of the bolts that you find on machine components will have those. That end little uh, graphic is firstly telling you it's imperial, if it's straight lines, and secondly it's telling you what grade bolt it is. It's very useful when you come to replace a bolt, because if you've got a very strong bolt and you replace it with a very weak bolt, that's a poor decision. Um, and so you need to actually match that material. 
Um, in the absence of that, if it's really critical, what you could actually do is a hardness test just on the head of the bolt. Um, and that hardness test should be able to relate to ultimate tensile and that sort of stuff. Um, if it's an application where it's really critical that you get the, get the bolt right, um, that requires you having a hardness testing machine and probably coming out and paying the units and to get it done, so you need to make it worthwhile. Great. 1, 2, 2, 5, 5, 5.2, 7 and 8. You know, nice and sequential and easy ones to um, I don't know why it's like that. I don't know why they've got a 5.2, because when we look at the metrics, they're all 4 point, you know, 6, 4.8, 5.8, 8.8, 9.8. No idea why it's like that. You can probably find it on Wikipedia and tell me if you like. But um, if it's an SAE grade, um, then it's a, an imperial. If it's an SAE class, then it's a metric. Um, and this will give you all of the sorts of information for each of those grades. So if you have an imperial thread, you obviously want an imperial class. If you have a metric thread, you want a metric class. I don't think there's such thing as a metric class going with an imperial thread or vice versa. So uh, if you've got one, you need the other. Information here, you're given a diameter range. So this is the common diameter range that that class will come in. Proof load, I was just telling you about that. Yield and ultimate, obviously. And look at the proof load. 33 KSI compared to 36, 55 compared to 57 and so forth. So it's just, just under that yield stress slightly. Um, and then you've got some other information about yield and, and etc. Um, some core hardness, so that's rock wall hardness. Pardon me, so you can actually compare that back to, you know, if you took a hardness measurement on the end bob. Um, so that's your imperial stuff. Metric stuff's there, so class 4.6, 4.8, etc. Um, all critical bolts in the FSA comp has to be 8.8 or greater. And that's just their way of making sure that you know, all of the bolts are strong. 8.8 um, is a good class of bolt for any sort of a dynamic type of application. Alright, so if you've just got, you know, you're just holding an I-beam to a pillar or something like that, you probably don't need that sort of strength because it's not a lot of dynamic loading. But as soon as you start having dynamic loading, about 8.8 or above is a good, good class of bolt. Uh, and once again, you're given a diameter range, proof load, yield stress, tensile strength. In some circumstances, they don't give you a yield stress, a yield strength. Um, so for those, I would just treat proof load um, as being equal to the yield stress. Um, so, um, for the SN, sorry, the, the AN diagram stuff, instead of having the yield line, because remember the yield line is like our static value, now we're just going to have a proof load line. So it's just going to be whatever proof load value you, you have. Cool. All right. So, <coughs> pretension. Anyone, anyone heard pretension of the bolt? Okay. Other than the fact that I've said it three times this lecture so far. So, um, there's a really good reason that we pretension bolts. Uh, probably the best reason is that if you put pretension on the bolts, that's putting compression between the two surfaces that you're bolting together, and that compression will cause friction between the plates and that friction will generally carry the shear stress rather than it loading up your shear plane on the bolt. Uh, and that's a very advantageous thing for us because shear is very critical in bolts so if we can ignore it, uh, it actually uh, makes, makes the bolt a lot, lot stronger or carry a lot higher load. So whilst you're putting initial axial load on the bolt, which is stress, and so any additional axial load on the bolt will add to that, and we need to take that into consideration. The advantage for removing the shear components of stress generally outweighs the additional axial you're putting on it. Um, additionally, it changes the way that things actually work on the AM diagram, and it's really counterintuitive that you can actually get better fatigue life when you pre-tension something up to like 90% of proof load than if you just have it completely loose initially. Um, and that still makes my noodle. Every year I recalculate that and prove it to myself and it's still counterintuitive to me. So you, you can prove it and I'll show that show you that when we do the fatigue stuff. But so there's some advantages to having pretension on those bolts. What's another one? Has anyone ever had to use a torque wrench? In what circumstance? Engine? Engine? So what's, what's the torque on the bolt actually doing? Well, I imagine it's either sealing it and 
to make sure you don't screw the head off the bolt and leave it in the floor. Yep, so it's an upper limit to how much torque you can put on it, but it's also a... Crush or something, any gasket. Yeah, so gasket, that's what I'm looking for. So between two surfaces, oftentimes you'll have a gasket, and the purpose of that gasket is to actually seal everything. All right, and so what you actually want to do is squash that gasket sufficiently that that gasket between the bolts is putting enough pressure on the plates to have a proper seal to a certain level of pressure. And so that pre-tension that specified on the bolt will actually pitch that gasket down sufficiently to seal. And that's very, very important on any uh, head in an engine block type applications, any sort of pressure vessel applications, um, pretty much anywhere where you've got some sort of a gasket there, you should be putting some sort of pre-tension on the bolt and that'll be specified. Now, the pre-tension tends to be roughly 90% of proof load. So the amount of stress will be 90% of proof load. We want to convert that into a force. Stress equals force on area, so we just rearrange. Force on area, area comes on this side, and Ki is whatever percentage of proof load you're told. So if I say tightened up to 90% of proof load, that's 0.9. Easy enough? If I say tightened up to 50% of proof load, that's 0.5 times area times the SP proof load, and that gives you the tensioning force, the initial force of the bolt. And that's an axial force of the bolt. How do I get an axial force of a bolt if I have a spanner and a bolt? Well, I can't because I can't put an axial force on a bolt with a spanner. What I can do is put a torque on a bolt with a spanner and I can get an equation that relates torque to axial force. And it's rough, right? It's rough depending on how tight your threads are and tolerances and how rusty and how much you put in the threads and all that sort of stuff. But it's approximately the amount of torque you want is 0.2 times the initial tension that you want times the nominal diameter of the bolt. And that's a very uh, coarse torque to axial force type equation. You can derive it yourself if you want. So, that's the torque that you would specify that someone used on their torque wrench. Has everyone seen the torque wrench? Has anyone not ever heard of a torque wrench before? Anyone? So, basically a wrench and it's not just, you know, a spanner, it's not just your standard completely mechanical fuse you bend. The actual part that rotates the bolt is, has some sort of internal rotation and there's something that will measure how much torque you're putting on the, on the actual handle. Which is actually, just from a mechanical standpoint, really interesting. The easiest one is, so some are fancy and they have little dials on them. The easiest one is a big long spanner and a single needle that comes out and the more torque you put on it the more the handle bends and as that handle bends down the needle on a reference frame that bends with the handle will actually move and you'll be able to work out how much torque you're putting on it so from a mechanical standpoint that's the easiest one to conceptualize much more fancy ones that you spend more money on will have little digital dials and all sorts of things on it um, but a standard big one for big gear is a nice big long handle that you just wrench around until the needle gets to a point and that's the torque you need. Okay? So um, when you're using a torque wrench, you or me, plus or minus 50% probably. Um, someone that's used one fairly regularly, plus or minus 30%. Um, if you're talking Ford, Toyota, Holden, etc., with computerized torque controlled spanners in the factory, maybe plus or minus 50%, uh, 15%, maybe less, yeah? So, the reason that when you go to a mechanic and they pull stuff apart and put it back together, things don't ever feel quite right, is because the gear that they're using is very different to the gear that the manufacturer, manufacturer used in the factory. So, a robot that gets every single bolt to the exact torque, torque. if you're talking Toyota, you're probably plus or minus 5%. If you're talking you know, Dodge, you might be talking plus or minus 15 I don't know. Um, if, you, if you picture a car that falls apart easily, it works. Um, a car that stays together for a very long time, better. German stuff, probably even better again, right? But still, 
you take that to a mechanic and a mechanic's dealing with the standard old torque wrench that has a certain accuracy level that isn't what is in the factory and so that's why things tend to be a little bit looser and a little bit worse and a little bit more noisy once, once you reassemble an engine that isn't factory. Um, but what that's telling you is that if you're specifying for a very, very, very tight tolerance and you have no factor of safety involved, uh, then you hand it to a tradesman that's using you know, a hundred dollar wrench, um, chances are they're going to over torque it or under torque it and everything's going to go pear shaped. So if you need super tight tolerances, you need to super tight gear. Um, otherwise, you need to factor in that range in your design, in your factor of safety and that kind of stuff. Um, Alright, so if we're just using tightening forces, obviously um, that's an axial force and we can calculate volmices by the square root of the square of it, so it's just that value and we compare that to proof load. Uh, if we've got shear and axial, if we can't ignore the shear because of the tightening forces, then you have to calculate it on mices in the same way that you've always calculated on mices. Okay? But for static loading, we just use this equation, which is exactly the same as the previous one. Before we had SN or SY or whatever, it's the same equation yeah, for static loading. Alright, that's a lot of talking. Uh, let's have a five minute break, uh, and then we'll go through an example and we'll call it a day. Alright guys, good to go. Start writing this
All right, and we need to specify bolt size. So much like with welds, specifying a weld size is probably the most common thing you're going to do. With bolts, specifying a bolt size is pretty much the most common thing you're going to do uh, because oftentimes bolts are just serving a purpose. They're just, all right, I have this thing. Let's bolt it together. How many bolts do we need? What size bolts? That's, that's the sorts of analysis that you do in the design side. Alright, what do we got? We're going to do a front view and a side view. Front view looks like this. So we have that triangular bolt pattern and we have a force that is not through the centroid, it is over to the side, hence the eccentricity. And I'll do a side view so that we know what we're talking about completely. It's a little bit different in bending though. 
because if we think about what's actually happening to this plate, it's not just direct bending, it's not just direct bending force distributed everywhere. Technically, we're tearing this plate off the wall. Does that plate rotate around the centroid in bending? Does this compress into the thing and that kind of thing? And kind of. But what would happen if these were elastic bands? Visualize what would happen there. If they were elastic bands just holding it together, and I put a load on the end, where would it pivot? That point there. Yeah? So, if this was a weld, we'd have compression here. Can we get compression on this bolt based on the bending? You don't get compression on bolts unless there's some weird sort of a machine component where you're putting force on it. But you can't get compression on this, so bending doesn't work the same. All right? Torsion and direct shear, they do work pretty much the same, but I'll show you what we have to do a slight, slightly different with that. But bending, we need to think about it a little bit differently. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to analyse the axial stress that results from that bending in the absence of the other two and then we're going to analyse the plane where that's actually shearing around. Alright? Um, before we do that, let's put some assumptions down. Are you told about any pretension? We got any pretension? No? I don't say anything about a pretension in the question. Uh, it would be erroneous to assume that there were pretension. So in this circumstance, we just assume that they're tightened up, maybe tightened and hand tight, certainly tightened up enough so that they're not gonna come loose, but not to impart any significant compression in those plates. As such, what we need to do is take uh, all of the shear load with the bolts. All right, so the first assumption that we're going to make is none of that shear load is carried by the plates, all of it's carried by the bolts. Now, the alternative might be, if there's 90% of proof load tightening up there, a sound assumption would be that all of that shear is carried by the plates. Now, you need to do probably two things in a, in a for keeps type analysis where things are at stake. The first is that you need to work out what sort of a uh, shear force that plate can actually take. Alright, so you can actually calculate based on compression and friction coefficients what sort of a force that friction in the plate can carry. Now we're not really going to do that. There's a one or two examples in your textbook of how to calculate that. Um, I'm not going to bother with it because we're going to either assume that the bolts take all the load or that the plates take all the load. But when there's something that's critical, that you need to make absolutely sure things aren't going to fall on people's heads or whatever, um, then working out that area, the friction coefficient and the amount of force and what load that can carry is quite important. Two, this load is pulling this off the wall. Whatever pretension you put on the bolt that cinches and holds it together, the load is then trying to pull it away, pull it apart. And if there's separation at any point, or, well, basically if there's separation, all your friction goes away. So you need to work out whether this is separating or not. And we'll do that, not today, but later. Um, because of today we're just assuming that the bolts are taking all the shear. But if you were saying that the plates take all the shear, you need to work out whether that's separating or not. The other thing is, when you calculate that friction calculation, you can't calculate it on the, we just tightened it up, it's perfect. You have to calculate it on the, it's now bent out as far as it possibly can and what's the load still in the place. Right, I'll give you the tools to do that, but we won't get that complicated. That's a very, very complicated state. All right, I'm just telling you about it because if you ever need to do these things and it's very important that that's the case, then you can, you can make that calculation yourself. Use a bit of engineering judgment. Stuff I keep talking about. All right, but for this one, we're just going to say bolts take it all because that's the most critical case for the bolt. If your bolts can take it all, even if the plates take some of it, it's safe. Yeah?
right? Um, we can add a bunch of our normal ones, white being negligible and material being homogeneous and all that sort of stuff. But we've got some extra ones, so I'll just write the extra ones down and you know you make those assumptions normally. Um, one that we're going to do is say that the for the downward shear, for just the V, just the shear in the bolts, those three bolts take that shear evenly. The same way that we said the weld takes the shear evenly over the entire weld cross section, we're going to say that those three bolts take that only the downward shear, because we'll calculate the axial force and we'll calculate the torsional shear. But the downward shear, we don't have any other mechanism to work out whether one takes more than the other. We're just going to assume that all three take the same. And that's, that's a sound assumption. Because this is over on the side, it wants to rotate this thing, it needs to rotate it around its centroid. And those shears that go around in a circle, much like the weld, will add to the downward shears, much like the weld. And so we're going to work out what those shear stresses are. And at the end, obviously we have an axial and a bunch of shears, and we're going to calculate long YCs. And pretty much play the same game we play with the welds. Draw a picture up high here and then I'll do the analysis over there. Yeah. Alright, so part one is axial bolt loads. Doesn't make sense to do a free body diagram of that. If 
You've got a shaft or a beam or whatever, it makes sense to do a free body dive. Okay? We've got this plate here, and whatever force, axial forces on the bolts, is equivalent to whatever force has to hold that plate on the wall under that load. It makes sense to do a free body diagram of this particular machine component. All right? So we didn't do them for welds. The reason was it doesn't make a lot of sense to do them for welds. We will do them for bolts because they're an actual discrete component that is free in space with forces on it. All right? Does everyone understand that distinction between a weld and a bolt? Weld is part of something, bolt is a separate entity. So we can do a free body diagram. Alright, so I've got the same thing that I've got over here. Let's do like that. That's as live as I'm going to go. Can everyone, you guys see that? Yeah. Alright, so in this plane I've got a 24 kilo newton force down here. So 24,000 newtons. points of our plate. So obviously the bolts need to hold it up and they need to hold it against the wall and potentially there's something happening at A as well. So the first thing we said at pivots about A and so if I have this force from a bolt or the, those two bolts and this force from that bolt the only other part of this plate well, the only other thing that can stop this plate shooting off in this direction is the wall. And if this is rotating down, you know, if that wasn't rotating down, if that was just some sort of a, a direct shear load, that would be maybe carried by the whole load. But because it's rotating around this point, as soon as you get separation, that point's the only point that stops from shooting off in this direction. So we're going to analyse that case. And A, we're going to have a horizontal force there. What's missing? Yep, at the moment it's shooting down that way. So, you've got a force up from the bolt, a force up from that bolt, and potentially, if you've got friction or something at that point, you might have force up there as well. Now, fortunately, the only, for axial load on the bolt, the only ones I care about is this one and this one. And so that's all we're going to analyse now, but to draw a full free body diagram, we want to make sure we have all of those forces involved. So, I'm going to call this if there's no friction, you could actually just assume that that one was nothing and then you can actually determine all of these. So I'm going to call this one FD dash because that's our FD box. And this one's 2FD. 2FD dash. Who better than dash? I don't know why that's on there. Um, because we have two bolts. So those bolts are capable of carrying twice the force of the bottom bolt. Yeah. So, well, we have two bolts, so there's two forces. So whenever the force in one of those bolts are up, on the free body diagram, the amount of force is double that. Right. So now what I do is I can do some of the forces around A. And all of those other forces that I don't care about go away. Because they're all in plane with that. So that's what we do. Some of the uh, sorry, sum of the moments around A. Equals zero equals that rotated by its lever arm is 24,000 times its lever arm 0.5. And that's added to a positive. Sorry, so that's negative. Added to a positive, so 2FD times this lever arm. 0.4. And this one is a positive plus Fe times 0.1. Alright, so that's equation one. And the unknowns. Two. So what am I going to find? I'm going to find another equation to characterize this. So let's do that.
Okay. Bob's are pretty interesting because what we actually do to get the extra equation both for this and for the for the next case is we actually visualize what the machine's doing and get a common sense equation from that. Alright, so this is peeling itself off the wall, and so we're going to leverage what we understand of it pivoting about that point to understand what the what the relationship between the top forces and the bottom forces are. Alright? The easiest way to do that is to picture these two things being elastic bands. Alright, and if they were elastic bands and I bent that thing down the wall, what is the ratio of force in those elastic bands based on how much they stretch? Alright? How much more does the top one stretch than the bottom one? And can we develop a relationship for it? Think about it for a second. Do we understand enough? Do we understand enough about triangles? If this pivots about this point, and let's say this rotates down 15 degrees, what's the length here compared to the length here? Can we calculate it based on what we know? Yep. It's just like triangles. Yep. And so the ratio of this to this is the same as the ratio of this to this. So the base of height thing with triangles. So, if I stretch this one degree, can I work out what the difference between you know, those are? Yes? So if I stretch that a very, very, very small amount, I can still work out what the ratio is. And for every point of that rotation down, the ratio between this force and this force will be the same because of it. Alright? So by looking at it and treating them like elastic bands and bending it around that pivot point, I've got a ratio for elongation. We understand the relationship between elongation and force based on like the spring equation. So F equals deflection times the spring stiffness. Doesn't matter what the spring stiffness is because they're the same for both bolts. Rearrange that and we get a relationship between the forces. And it's just a ratio based on this and this. Yeah. Um, which makes sense because it pivots about that point. Both bolts have to be deflected by the same amount. 
Okay? So we take it into consideration, you don't need to worry about it for that part. Alright? But now we have two equations and two unknowns.
bulk size. Uh, do we know material properties? What's our bulk class? 9.8. So 9.8, our table gives us our SP. Remember that what was the equation? It was from my C is equal to SP on N. N6, SP from table. Stress is just equal to force on area. Area is unknown. We can calculate the required bulk area. And then we go to that table and work out the bulk width either that exact area, which is going to be very, very rare, or an area just a tick above. So if you calculate 250 and you've got a bulk that's got 266 or something like that, a little bit more area, carries a bit more stress, that's your bulk. Yeah? So rather than put diameters and all that sort of garbage in this equation, that's, that's a big waste of your algebraic time. Just calculate an unknown area, go to the table, choose an appropriate area in a bulk. And you'll have a couple, so you can either choose a fine threaded one or a coarse threaded one. The fine threaded one will have a little bit more area, which means that you can have a little bit smaller bulk. Right? And so that might be important if you've only got a very, very narrow gasket or something like that, that you know, smaller holes is better. Um, but that's up to you. So if this was our entire process, we'd very quickly get to a, a bulk solution. Why don't you guys do that right now? Spend, spend five minutes, tell me what size bowl if I just have this axial loading. This is your equation here, hopefully. Um, just to oh, it's this up. Yep. So do the quick calculation and then we'll do the add the case for the shear. Tell me what size bowl will carry that. SP, oh you don't have that table there. Um, if you don't have the textbook, SP is, so we've got, what do we say, a class 9.8 bolt. Uh, proof load is 650 megapascals. 650. Can we calculate an area yet? What do we need? 135 millimetres squared. Is that what everyone got? Alright. So, area millimetres squared, 115, 157. So, what did you say? 130 something? So, we fall in that category in the middle there. Obviously, we want a bigger area, more area, less stress. So, we take a step down. And if we want coarse threads, we need a 16 mil bolt, which is specified. And this is an important point. Don't tell me a 16 mil volt. If it's metric, I want an M 16 by 2. That tells me what sort of volt you want. Or, if we want coarse threads, we say 130, so 125 or 167, it's going to be in the middle there, so 167. Still M 16 by 1.5. That volt's cheaper for the same purpose. So you'll choose a coarse Easy enough? So, uh, when you just have axial load on the bolt, it's pretty easy. Alright, next bit.
free body diagram of the plates again. Okay. So 
This distance here is 200. This distance is 150 squared plus 100 squared or square root. Someone want to do that for me quickly? It's not accurate. Uh, and remember the analogy that we used with the pulling it off the wall. We made them rubber, made them elastic, and worked out what the equivalent deflection for the same amount of, say, force is. We can do exactly the same here. Um, and so let's do that first. Well, let's talk about that briefly. fan of doing really simple little mud map type things to understand things better, right? So in my office I did this when I was thinking about how to explain it better than I explained it last year because that was a bit muddy. Um, I suggest all of you do that. Excel spreadsheets are brilliant. If you have an equation that you don't understand, just throw a few values down the left hand side and just put the equation there and just see how the equation behaves over a range of values. That kind of stuff takes you four seconds, but it allows you to understand a problem much, much better and start to sort of, you know, work through at a deep level rather than just doing what it says in the notes. Okay, so this is a good example of that. So this isn't part of the analysis, this is just my demonstrating how we're going to break the force up over these three guys, much like the derivation I did before. And so what we actually have is this whole thing rotating around its centroid. And so you can imagine that this length, that bolt, or that hole, if this rotated around the centroid, that hole would move not as far, or this one would move further. It's further away, so if it was rotating around the same point, if it's further away, its circumferential transit, I suppose you call it, would be more. And the ratio of that circumferential transit of this hole compared to that hole is the ratio of forces. We can calculate that very easily based on a ratio, much like what we did before. And this is the proof of that. So let's say, for example, because I don't want to deal with 180 and 200, let's say that these are 1, and this bolt is 2. Alright, and so for the same, let's say, I think I said 5 degrees of rotation, 5 degrees, this one will rotate out a certain distance, and for the same 5 degrees, that one will rotate and that one will rotate the same. Alright? And the ratio of those lengths of travel for our elastic bolt, we can relate back to force in exactly the same way, so deflection related to force through stiffness, etc. Okay. So, what's the circumference of each of these circles? The small one, C equals 1 times pi, and the big one, C equals 2 times pi. So that's the total circumference. Right? The actual distance travel, particular angle, let's say it's 5, so the ratio of the total circumference is 5 divided by 360. We're very comfortable with that, and that's the distance along the outside of the circle that we travel for a particular degree. If we traveled 180, it would be 180 divided by 360 is half the circumference. So the ratio we're traveling is 5 on 360. So, distance of the... Would the circumference be between 5 and 4 pi? Say that again. The circumference would be 2 pi and 4 pi. Oh yeah, sorry, 4 pi, yeah. Same thing, all good. Um, so, the distance of the radius equals 2 is 5 on 360, so the ratio is let's say 5 degrees, times the circumference is 4 pi, and the distance of the radius of 1 equals 5 on 360, 2 pi. We 
between the drink here. So the ratio between the two, boil all that down, dr equals two on dr equals one equals two. So you've got twice the force here as you do here because you have twice the movement here that you do here. Pretty fundamental stuff, but like, like once you get sort of circumferences and pies and things like that, it's nice to just write it down and make sure. All right, so for any given angle of rotation of this whole thing, the ratio between this length and this length is the ratio between how far they'll move, and if we use that sort of spring stiffness analogy, the distance that they move is related to the distance or the amount of force linearly. So the ratio of force for this case between 2 and 1 is going to be 2. Now if that's, what is it, 200 and 180, then the force here is going to be 200 divided by 180, because it's going to be more, times that force. And that's exactly what we use. Which is a bit more, but they're kind of 
bit more askew. So you'd imagine that they're roughly, they could be roughly equivalent in magnitude. You could calculate them if you wanted to. But remember that this has four times the axial load. So it's nowhere near enough to make us want to analyze both places. It's close enough. And this one is going to be more critical than this one because that one places the way, this one adds together. That bad boy is our, our critical goal. We'll analyze him. Yeah. Um, and that's exactly what we'll do. Um, we can calculate on mices. So we want x and, x and y components of the vectors. Add the x's, add the y's, square, square, multiply by 3, add to the axial force, and we can get an axial uh, an equivalent stress if we want. Um, or we can go ahead and calculate the stresses, which is what we'll do. What time? Alright. I'll put the rest of the solution online. You guys comfortable doing that, or you want me to go through a little bit more of it? Reckon you can do the vector addition? So, you've got three F's now. Turn them into X, Y, and Z X. And stress just equals force on area. So you'll have an unknown area in all three values of stress. Sub that into bond mices. Take one on area out the front of it. Rearrange for area and go to your bulk table. So tell me in the next lecture tomorrow what size bulk you want. And I'll put the, put the solution online for you to check yourself. Good? Alright. Have a good uh, Tuesday.